Uh, hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode in Reported to Resolved. In this series, I'm going to be interviewing the people behind the scenes of Bug Bounty. You hear a lot from the Bug Bounty hunters, the people who post on Twitter, yay, I just got awarded a bounty for ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, but you don't really hear about the people handing out that money. Uh, so in this series, I'm going to start talking to people who just work behind the scenes and ask them things like what their job is, how they kind of fit into that life cycle, um, and for you to actually meet the people who might be triaging your bugs, who decide how much you get paid, who write out scopes and assets. So with me today is Pascal. He's a security engineer at Dynatrace. Now, his job sits as a bug bounty program manager, and he's also a fellow YouTuber at Hacksplain. Now, if you're interested in bug bounties because you're watching my content, you should probably be watching his content as well. It's, he's really just starting out at the moment, so we can really show him some love. Um, so, hi, Pascal. Uh, welcome. Do you want to tell me what your job is? Sure. Well, first of all, Katie, I appreciate that you're having me on this awesome show, awesome channel. Um, what my job is. So as at Dynatrace, I'm like 70, 80% into penetration testing, right? So we have a lot of features being released and me and, and a couple of folks do perform penetration tests on a regular basis or mostly before features are going live, right? And this is, I would say, the, the bigger part of my job. But then I'm also running, as, as you've already stated, the Dynatrace Bug Bunny program. And there's a couple other things that I do, like, well, going into support cases and, well, running some, some enablement sessions for our employees and stuff like that, right? But I guess to, today we're talking about the, the Bug Bunny part of it, right? Well, that's super interesting. It's really cool to see actually that bug bounties make up kind of just one part of your job really like you have all of these other kind of aspects that really tired um so what does a typical day in your life look like like how much is doing bug bounty managing how much is actually doing the penetration testing what do you do when you get to the office right so with bug bounties you you kind of really plan when something is coming in right it's always up to the amount of Bug bunny hunters out there taking the time to search for vulnerabilities in, in your program. So I don't really know if it's if it's like a Monday morning and I come into the office, I don't really know how many new submissions we have. So I, I would check first thing in the morning, I'll hack one inbox and see if there's something new in it. And if, if not, I'll just continue with my regular work. Um, so regular work for me would mean I I have a Pantas scoped and planned for this week. And I would just work on that throughout the day until there is a support case or a bug via, via a hacker one in our case coming in. And then I would just take myself an hour or two to work on that and then switch back to my penetration test engagement. That's super interesting. So you almost interrupt your day really to deal with um, the bug bounty reports because as you say, you just kind of pick them up as they come. Do you do that based on like severity? Like does if a medium comes in you go oh, i can wait versus a critical where you're like oh shit <laughs> yeah no absolutely so what we have is the the paid triaging service by hacker one right and, and that means if there is a bug coming in hacker one or like the, the triaging team better say at, at hacker one have a look at the bug first they are going to reproduce it and then they're summing it up in 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 like a, a nice summary which usually looks a little bit different from the the submission the back when you handed in and then sends you that and says well here it is we've reproduced it now you can work with it this takes well up to like two days usually okay. and as 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 you've said what happens if a critical is coming in we obviously don't want to wait for two days so what i'm always doing is if the bug is coming in i will have a quick glance at it and we'll just check by by skimming over it if it looks like a critical or like a p1 whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. if if it's not i will leave it to the triaging team of, of hacker one to have a look at it first and then look at it later when, when they have sent over the summary right so you've kind on, of on the other hand the... sorry go ahead uh, yeah i just want to say on the other hand if it's a critical 
we we're not waiting for them right we we're escalating the bug straight mm -hmm. away and and try to fix it uh get it out to the developers and to to the team if, if some sort of investigation is needed as, as fast as possible so that actually kind of covers the question i was going to ask but like how would you say your job fits into the kind of bug bounty life cycle so you've kind of mentioned that you kind of look at the report see if there's something that urgently needs attention but actually otherwise you let hacker one triage it what kind of happens from your point of view you mentioned talking to developers about criticals how does it work for kind of lower uh, priority bugs if you like well so so for lower ones so i, I guess I, I i do have pretty much the the same job or not the same job but i, I guess the same skill set as like the triaging team right so I, I do comprehend the the bug in the same way what what, what they are doing right they they're looking at it they know what it is they have seen those bugs before and it's the same for me so i'm i'm having this this quick look like i've stated before and if it's a low one i will leave it to them to to do the the first triaging for me first because we're paying for that right that's part mm -hmm. of our service yeah, of course. it's um and also saves me time and it, it gives me the time to work on my on my other things which is mainly penetration testing which if if, if you if you want to find um the the comparison to the bug bunny wall to me is is almost like the, the same work right like if i'm running a penetration test I am testing Dynatrace features. The bug bunny hunters, they're testing Dynatrace features. They're searching for all sorts of vulnerabilities from like idols to SSRFs and whatsoever. I'm doing the exact same thing. So if you if you want, you, you could actually see me like the same way as, as all the mm -hmm. bug bunny hunters working on the Dynatrace program out there. And and to me, this is this is pretty interesting and pretty fun. It's it's just that if I'm reporting it. I'm not getting a nice reward. <laughs> <laughs> you get a regular salary. Yeah. Um, that's right. <laughs> so I guess really my next question is kind of related to what you said. Uh, what do you think the value of bug hunting is then for Dynatrace? If you're doing your penetration testing, what are, if you like, the bugs that, the difference in bugs and what kind of value is there in having bug bounties as well as penetration testers? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, if you look at our bug bunny brief, we have not a big number actually of items in scope, but but our assets, the ones we have in scope, are massive. Like testing all those, like from A to C, would be a, a mind blowing job. Like that doesn't work. I I couldn't do that in a year. So that's why we have and want the whole community support with with the bug bunny community to help us out. We're having a small team a small penetration testing team. And that's why I wanna have them helping us out in finding all the bugs. And you might be right that in a lot of times they are looking at the exact same features components um, like like we are doing at, at this point in time, but, but then in like 99% of the time they're looking at something completely different, right? I guess it's a different way of thinking as well. Being internal, you have a lot more kind of insider knowledge that you're maybe using but actually that means you could potentially miss things because you're like well i know how that works because i it's part of our core product i guess from a hacker coming from an external point of view you kind of seeing that difference almost with them um so let's talk about bugs because here's what i need to know here's what i've always been curious about what happens after a bug has been submitted you say it goes to hacker one's triage team that ends up in your inbox what happens then like how does that end up being fixed essentially yeah no that's a good question so we're we're also using a ticketing system with jira internally and as, as soon as the um, triaging team comes in saying well look we have triage just finding for you this this is an actual vulnerability you gotta deal with it we are having automation in place that creates a cheer ticket for us. And then I'm just having like a final look, like if the ticket has all the information which is needed on it. And then uh, I give it to the developer. I, I give the, the DAF like a day or two time. And then I will get back to him saying, look, like have, have you understood what the problem is, what the vulnerability is? Do you need some help to, to fix it? And a lot of times our people are quite skilled and they actually already know what to do. So 
they, they just come back to me saying, hey, yeah, well, give me a couple of days and this will be in production. But um, yeah, if not, and I'll just have one out and we together try to, to get it fixed as soon as possible. So it's quite a collaborative thing for you and the developer, really. Yeah, absolutely. It is like it has this huge enablement component, if you would like to say. So like if, if there is a, a new dev, for example, dealing with a feature where a, a bug is found in and I, I, I don't know, like just, just an example right now, there would be a, a service side request for to vulnerability coming in, right? And I, I hand it over to him and he has no idea what it is. As soon as I hand it over, I explain it to him. And at this point, he learns about it and hopefully re remembers himself about it when he keeps on coding in, well, uh, the next couple of years. So all, all the people are learning with us handing over the, the bugs to them. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I have to ask, though, have you ever made fun of a developer for making a really silly mistake and causing like a huge security vulnerability? Ever give them a little, ever poke fun at them? Or is it completely like, no, I understand. No, well, so we, at no point we want to play the, the blaming game or something like that. So, so we would not say, how silly are you or something like that? That doesn't make sense. We're here to support, right? It's, it's completely natural that people make mistakes. And a lot of, a lot of times they, they just didn't know better. And, and it's fine. We, we don't have, or we don't only have like, 20 year software veterans, right? We have like people who are in their, their, their first job who have been working for us for like a year only or something like that. And they cannot know all, all the security details of, of the world. So we, we try to collaborate with them and never blame them. That's, that's a really cool. Like I, I was a former developer and I would always worry that some security person would be yelling at me about my code. It uh, doesn't help. It just doesn't help. <laughs> What makes a good bug report? For you, what makes something good? Yeah, good question. Um, it's, it's actually super easy, but we see a lot of times that people are, are getting it wrong. Like, just, just think about it that way. Like, the, the, the person you're handing this report over doesn't, usually doesn't know what, what you were going through with your thinking process. So just try to put that on paper, put that into the report and do that step by step. So start with, I was going to feature acts and I, I you, you can say, you can name the tools. Like you can say I was using Burb, which, which I usually like because I'm using the same tools as, as those guys are doing, right? You just put in the, the technical details, the, the full details that you have, and then walk me through it step by step. Like uh, I intercepted it, I changed this parameter, I saw this happening, I used this information and put it back there, like step by step. Don't just say, I started here and then in the end, I found this, right? This is not a good report. And then use a lot of images, PNGs, whatever you have, put it in the report. Um, maybe if, if you have like a little recording app on your computer, make like a little video about it and, and put it into the report as well. So literally like everything that can help me and, and obviously also the, the triaging team of HackerOne in our case is, is helping and that makes a good report for me. Cool, cool. Um, so part of your job is obviously dealing with reports, but actually as a program manager, quite a lot of your job is dealing with the entire program, not just the kind of individual bugs. So you kind of decide how the program runs, right? What assets are in scope, what kind of bugs you're looking for, you know, the money involved, you know, that kind of almost, you know, liaising with the Dynatrace. Um, so what happens when you start up a bug bounty program? What happens internally? What are people doing? How do you actually make that decision? And kind of walk me through the steps almost of going, we want to do this in addition to our own penetration testing. Yeah, so for us, this took place around a year ago. So we're just in our second year right now of, of running our external bug bunny program. And a year ago when, when we were, or like a year and a half ago, when we were thinking about it, we obviously had to, well, talk to a lot of people. There's, there's stuff like legal uh, the legal department where you have to talk to about the program obviously they have a lot of questions there are financial questions there's there's a lot of things you you, you start to deal with and um 
those are obviously not the, the most interesting ones because you just want to get this program started and like work on the actual bugs and submissions. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the stuff that is important prior to signing up with any, any um, bug bunny program supplier like HackerOne and BugCrowd or all the others. Um, I don't know Is how- Is there a lot how, of support internally or were people really skeptical about it? So a lot of times I heard, why would you do that? Don't we have a lot of people hacking our websites, our applications then, which we wouldn't have otherwise? And I, I kept on explaining them, look, like if we do not have this problem, people will do the exact same thing. The, the difference if, if we're running it is that now we at least hear about a lot of the vulnerabilities people find. Otherwise, we wouldn't even hear about it because to just take them and sell them at the black market or do something else with it, right? And, and this, this took a little while to get into the heads of, for example, a legal department. But, but yeah, they, they realized that there is a real benefit behind a Bug Bunny program. And it, it didn't take that long. I, I don't want to say oh, that really? it took us months. It, it took us a couple of weeks, that's for sure. But yeah, no, we all agreed on, on running a program pretty fast. And, and maybe this was also due to the fact that we were running an internal Bug Bunny program organized and managed by me before with, without any company. So I had set up this internally hosted Bug Bunny program for our employees where they were allowed to, to hand in vulnerabilities and we paid them out rewards on top of the salaries and stuff. That was pretty fun too. And, and also helped us to to remediate a lot of the really, really low hanging fruits first. And then ah. we, we took it to another we took it to another level and and put it out there to to all the people um throughout the globe, right? Um, so I kind of want to ask a question and this may seem a little bit irrelevant, but quite a lot of my followers are kind of beginners and a lot of the time they worry that they won't find bugs. So I'm kind of curious, um, you mentioned that a lot of low hanging fruit was picked up by the internal one, but I'm sort of, how many beginners or kind of beginner friendly bugs would you say you got when you launched your program live? Do you think you got a fair amount or was it mostly those kind of higher level bugs? I would definitely say that our program when we launched it was like semi-hardened. So okay. it, it wasn't it wasn't as easy as going to like a, a, a web app view, throwing in 10 XSS payloads and, and finding whatever five XSSs and then submitting them. There, there were probably, I, I don't even remember a single XSS report that we've received over the last year because prior to launching, we have invested so much work and time to get rid of all of those. Mm -hmm. And we just really didn't want to have them out there the, prior to launching our program because it's, it, it's just such, it's such a silly bug and it's so easy to remediate, right? And um, yeah, I would say it was semi-hardened. But then on the other hand, we saw bugs coming in where we, where we thought afterwards, like, why haven't we found that by ourselves before? So we definitely still got low-hanging fruits after launching. But yeah, the, the number was, was low. That's interesting. Um, so let's kind of talk about assets and scope. Um, how do you decide your scope? Do you just throw everything out there? Do you kind of have discussions with developers about what they want in scope? Um, how do you make that decision? Yeah, good question. Um, so from the security team's perspective, the, we obviously want to almost have like everything in scope, but it's not that easy. I mean, we would love to have that because giving the bug bunny hunters more scope. They have more stuff to find. We will have more submissions. And in the end, we will have a more robust product, which is like a win-win-win situation. Mm -hmm. But what, what people don't understand, and I guess this is this is pretty insightful for all the bug bunny hunters out there, it's not that easy. There are so many stakeholders involved. For example, take Component X has like a, a product architect. It has like a product manager. It has the entire devs working on that it has a, a team lead like all those people have to be communicated with prior to putting something in scope and there, there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't put something in scope at at point x in time like um feature x is not stable enough to be put in scope like there's there's still a lot of vulnerabilities we, we already know about in there and we do not that, that actually helps the bug bunny hunters out there because we do not want to put that in scope and then tell 
all of them that the findings and duplicates and because duplicates mm -hmm. suck, right they, they don't want to have that and this is this is like a main reason why we're not putting something out there where we know that there's a lot of vulnerabilities in it because we would have to tell them about us knowing of of a certain bunch of those right and that's not really that's not really good um there's also other reasons um a lot of times it's infrastructure based we for example have a a feature i, I don't want to say too much about it what it is but in for that feature we only have one infrastructure which is shared mm -hmm. with uh, a couple of different folks and it's just that the team sat for that for that component we do not want to have hackers hacking the same infrastructure that we use for certain really important tests or something like that. And this is another reason why something doesn't go into scope. Um, so a lot of people have this idea that everything should be in scope. Um, and because it makes everything safer. Uh, there's quite a lot of people who have this belief and you think, you know, everything should be in scope because, you know, it makes your product safer if people can hack on it. I'm sort of curious from your point of view, what you think of that personally. It's, it's a dream scenario. And I totally understand it from like a bug bunny uh, hunters view that this, this would be the best case, but it's, yeah, it's the same story. It just doesn't work like that. There's a lot of times simple, simple things like if if they all hack on a certain asset you would have all those additional log lines with mm -hmm. um their, their attack payloads and something like that and then there is a team which would have to go over those and probably spend a lot of time on looking at attack payloads which are actually coming from um the hacker one crowd which which would be sort of wasted time because it's it's legitimate hack attempts and i know that there is some that there are some some ways to to get rid of those problems like using a certain header which says hacker one or something like that but then you you also open up this um well basically uh non-investigated hack attempt for for attackers for actual attackers and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's not always easy there's so many things going on in the back which which people don't see from the outside and i i guess that's that's mainly the reason why not everything is in scope i think it can be difficult to realize sometimes that you know we see these websites and they're kind of faceless you know we don't know who built them we're just hacking a thing a product and I think quite a lot of times people forget that actually that product is maybe five people's firstborn child and yeah. there's a manager involved and there's infrastructure engineers. I think it can be quite difficult for people really to kind of see that connection. I think security kind of sits in the middle of there where you see both this kind of faceless website side, but you also mm -hmm. see the kind of human side almost. Yeah, and not all the teams have the exact same size, right? Like even in the, in a like semi big company like ours, there are still teams which are pretty new, which are working on something, I don't know, which which came out a couple of weeks ago or something like that, and and they don't have twenty, thirty people working on it. Like even in bigger companies like ours, we still have teams of two working on something. They just don't have time to get ten, twenty submissions in a day and work on those they they got to push the feature first and this is another reason why you cannot put everything in scope you got to let take? them take sorry yeah i just want to say you got to let them time to develop as well they're not they're not like a full security team in, in the back that works on on remediating those right how long does it actually take for a feature to go from kind of um new to mature enough to really have open that up to bug bounty programs how long does it take for that well i don't know if i can answer that <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> like yeah, cover cover all uh bases but but yeah i mean dynatrace has been out there for like the last 15 years and there are still features which are not in scope. There are features which are only a year old and they're already in scope. It always depends. I guess there's no, no one single answer that's for that. That's key in security. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's have a chat about certain bugs. 
Now, a lot of programs have bugs that are out of scope. How do you make the decision that a bug is out of scope? I guess a lot of times it's pretty clear. I, I, I can give you an example. We, for example, do have the source code for um, certain, it's, it's three different individual GitHub repositories owned by Dynatrace in scope, right? It, it's pretty simple. It's, it's github.com slash, and then it's Dynatrace and two others. And then there is a lot of people who just neglect the fact that, that only those three are in scope. And they would just search for something on whatever, github.com slash something completely different. And they hand it in and they're like, why are, not, why are you not giving me money for that? And I'm like, well, look, it's pretty simple. You searched in a completely different repository, which doesn't belong to us. And this is a classic, like, I guess, our, in like 70% of our cases, this is the no reward out of scope uh, case that we see. I guess it's just read the scope and stay in scope. So what kind of bugs do you see a lot of? So you mentioned that's a lot of our kind of um, uh, lower ones. Do you see a lot of uh, NAs, a lot of lows, mediums, highs, hopefully not a lot of crits, but what kind of bugs do you see? Yeah, quite interestingly, almost no criticals to, to highs, which might might sound good because you, you want to have a robust and, and secure product and you don't want to have highs and criticals. But on the other hand, I'm always scrutinizing if this is, I don't know, due to maybe not high enough rewards or something like that. If this is due to not having the best people in the world invited to a program, which is actually a super hard task to, to get the best people. Oh, really? Board. Oh, it's super hard. And yeah, I would say the majority is somewhere between low and medium. That's really, that's really interesting. Were you surprised by the kind of bugs you got in the end? Were you expecting more highs and crits? Or were you kind of, you, know, you made sense for the kind of bugs you're finding internally? Yeah, no, I, I guess when we started, I, it was just two people in the internal penetration testing team. And I was like, I'm pretty sure two people cannot cover all the stuff that we release. And we have like 800 developers releasing stuff every, every two weeks, like we release every two weeks. And I was like, there must be a lot of highs and criticals in it. It, it, it cannot be, it cannot be any other way. There gotta be a lot of them in it, but they were just not coming in. And I mean, by now I'm not surprised anymore because I, I am pretty sure that we have a good product, but yeah. Sometimes At the start, you still... were just shocked. Like, my software yeah. can't be this secure. Yeah. You were, you know, right? the, were you surprised with the type of bugs you got, like idols versus you know, XSS? You mentioned how you don't tend to get much XSS at all. But were you kind of surprised by that, by the technical aspect? Um, no, it's, it's kind of hard to, to have expectation expectations and what you would get because... I mean, there's literally like 100% of, of bugs out that people could find. And I was just waiting for any of them, right? Um, of the categories. Um, I, I no, I wasn't really surprised. Um, I, I do see right now that a lot of them go into the same direction. And this is then some sort of, some, some sort of metric that we use internally. And okay. we're making use of that knowledge to, um, well, put this specific category and scope for the next six months and, and try to come up with, with better automation to remediate those bugs before they're going live and stuff like that. So we're using all that data we're collecting to perform a couple of different tasks. So you mentioned using data there. Uh, do you collect like a lot of data or do you think you kind of collect some? You mentioned how you like to use it to um, kind of better inform you personally about what's happening but I'm kind of curious what kind of data do you collect and where does that kind of end up for you does it end up in just an internal knowledge base or yeah no I was mainly I was, I was I was mainly referring to um the the vulnerability categories right like hacker one ah, okay. for example has this nice report that they're sending you over once every three months I guess and it, it tells you well, in, in this period of time, you had 
sixty percent, let's say idols or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we would be, well, that's interesting. Why was the number of idols so big? And we would take this this data that we have of that report to say, well, obviously we do have some sort of access control problems apparently. Mm -hmm. And then we try to that's actually a couple of different people within our team try to come up with automation to get rid of this exact problem. And then we see a plunge in, in that category and see maybe another one um, going get, getting uh, more findings and then we concentrate on that one. I got to ask more questions on this. So I'm a data scientist formally. Um, so okay. I really love data. Um, so I guess what I really want to ask is, do you see those rise and falls that really end up with like the popularity of bugs? We start to see now that XSS is pretty well defended in a lot of cases. It's a very common bug. The same thing happened to SQL injection a few years ago. You almost never see it now. Mm -hmm. um, with the rise of stuff like uh, HTTP request smuggling, do you think that with the almost the popularity of bugs that your uh, kind of metrics are showing that where bugs kind of fall out of favor? Or do you think that's really specific to your organization? No, you definitely see that. But I guess with those, you you also see a lot of automation. For example, um, let's let's say um, subdomain animations, um, uh, subdomain takeovers, right? Th those can be pretty easily automated. And, and people do that and you see that. You get submissions which look the exact same when you get two, three, or five of them. It, you see that somebody took the time studied, I, I would assume everything he found in a topic, put it into a tool, and then uses it against every single program within that Bug Bunny platform, right? That, that's that stuff you see, but that's just like the short little wave coming up. Mm -hmm. And then once you once you got hit by this, well, tool, tool and, and maybe a couple of other tools, other people, right? Then it just goes down and you, you never see it again. That's super interesting. Um, so let's let's talk about money. Um, do you have a budget and how does it work? Yeah, we do have a budget. It doesn't work with a budget without a budget. Um, how does it work? There is um, upper level management where I have to ask for budget. <laughs> that's how, <laughs> that's how it works. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to them with open hands. I'm like, I need some money for my hat <laughs> one program. It's it's no, it's legitimately how it works. I, I cannot say um, in in this interview how high or like the the amount of a budget, but it, it's the way it works, right? You you go to your management, you ask for a specific budget, they approve the budget, and yeah, then you can give it away to the bug bunny hunters. So how do you decide how much a bug is worth? Are you just looking at severity? Are you looking about severity maybe with some internal testing actually it's a little bit more severe how does it kind of work from your point of view rewarding hackers for their work mm -hmm. yeah another good question so when we started out in april 2019 we had so if, if you if you work with hacker one you have a program manager who talks to you about all all the stuff and one of the things is is rewards right and he was like well where do you want to um, put your uh, rewards in, in like this whole um, set of companies taking part in the bug bunny world. And I'm like, yeah, what, what is, what is, what is the standard? Like, just help me out here. Like I'm, I'm new to this. Right. So I basically relied on, on the data of hack one. And they said, well, look, like people, companies usually start here. And then after a couple of years, they go up to this point, to this point, this point. And in our case, we started with the max bounty of $1,500 for a critical and this was when we started out in, in 219 right now we have raised them by like 100 percent. so now we are at three thousand dollars for a critical and this this goes um, along with like the majority level right you cannot put out whatever twenty thousand for a critical if your product is not mature enough so you got to start mm -hmm. with a little low amount of bounties let a couple of folks work on it, find a lot of stuff, pay out the rewards. And then when you feel, and this is actually what, what we felt three months ago, that you have reached a new level, you can raise your bounties. And with that, you hope that there is a whole lot of, of new book bunny hunters getting attracted to your program and then start working on it. 
yeah and now we are at three thousand for criticals i i don't know when the next race is going to be i know that but when hunters out there wish that it would be tomorrow but it won't be tomorrow <laughs> I guess it's quite difficult to make that justification as well, to be able to offer something like $20,000, which is, you know, uh, can be someone's entire year's salary. Um, so I guess it's quite difficult to convince somebody, yeah, that's, you should pay that. Um, yeah. And I guess that means you get way, I'm guessing you get way fewer um, issues with trying to justify the bug bounty program by kind of offering smaller bounties and really showing the value essentially. Um, what? Sorry, what? What did you mean with that? Uh, do you do you think it also helps you justify with a smaller amount to really show the value of bug bounties? So people aren't like, well, that's a lot of money. I t mm. Yeah, no, mm. totally. Um, we have we have these quarterly meetings with with our management with with my management. And they're always interested in the numbers. I mean, this this is how the management usually works, right? They're like, how much does a bug cost to the company? And I'm like, well, look, we have whatever, received 50 submissions. The average payout was this. If you sum it up, it's, well, we've spent, I don't know, like $10,000 and the average would be $500 for a bug. And they would be like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But yeah, you, you want to, pay up more but to to some extent you cannot do that you you gotta first mature your program a little bit um so you mentioned before uh, a little while ago that it can be sometimes difficult to recruit hackers and you mentioned that um that tends to you believe to link into how much bounties you pay uh how much kind of interaction does your security team have with the community on that level are you seeing the same hackers repeatedly becoming experts on your services um are you seeing kind of people interacting on social media i'm just kind of curious how that ties into the community aspect of bug bounties yeah so, so I'm, I'm i guess i'm trying a lot of different things i mean i am posting a lot of stuff on twitter i know the whole community is on twitter so that's where i am too right mm -hmm. which only makes sense i, I try to convince them to I gotta say that first probably our, our program is still private so you cannot just ah, okay. go on to hacker one and and search for it i i still have to send out an invite to the people so that's probably an interesting fact to know about our program but i'm all I'm, I'm i'm always willing to send out invites if somebody really wants to join and yeah i i just try to interact with the people i see on twitter who are having well a lot of interesting um, blog posts or having a lot of interesting bug bunny tips to share and something like that you it, it, i guess it's pretty easy to spot the people who are knowledgeable right on twitter and mm -hmm. i try to send them invites but I, I i do see that a lot of times they're just accepting them and never really use them because mm -hmm. obviously they probably get the exact same invite by well plenty of others, 50 other companies in Hacker One, and they can just handpick what programs they like best. So I guess we still have to improve on that in a little bit to make our program more attractive. But so yeah. I gotta ask, if people want an invite listening to this video and they're like, that sounds interesting, should they just at you on Twitter? How should, if they want that invite and want to get involved with your uh, program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my Twitter handle is Pascal, like my name, followed by SEC, so S-E-C. They can always reach out to me, send me a message. My, my DMs are open. And um, ask me for an invite. We Maybe let me explain why we cannot give out too many of them. The, the infrastructure that we're using or having put in place for HackerOne researchers is costing us a lot of money. So we want to give every single researcher their individual tenant to work on. I, I've seen different programs. I, I'm i participating in the Bug Bunny world as well, right? And I've seen programs where you get like an account which is shared with 500 others. And then this guy logs out and suddenly you're logged out as well, which is a terrible experience. And, and we didn't want to have that. So we are giving them on their individual accounts. And in our case, we're running on AWS and that comes with a certain amount of costs. 
So we cannot just make it public and let 200,000 people hack our program because then our infrastructure would be too weak. This, this is, I guess, the one and only reason right now why we are still running in private mode. But yeah, if, if they come up to me on Twitter or I, I guess I can be found on a couple of different uh, channels as well, they can convince me that they want to, or that there would be good researchers and that they want to have an invite and I will send it out to them. Cool. Um, so a lot of people aspire to be bug bounty hunters, but actually there's a whole kind of career outside bug bounty hunting. Specifically, there's the whole world is it that you're a part of the um the triage side the developer side the security engineer all these different parts that really make this tick which we've talked about um so what's cool about your job why do you love your job and why should somebody else be interested in pursuing it if there may be a bug bounty hunter who is looking for a career but isn't sure bug bounty hunting in general is secure enough yeah well <laughs> I guess one of the the most calming facts about my job is that I, I do get my salary once a month. It's it's always the same. I will get it the exact same day every single month and I can live off my salary, which is a pretty good feeling to have. I know for a lot of um, Buck Bunny Hunters, they, well, who are probably not in the top 100, it's not the exact same way, right? They might find a, a 5k bug this this one point in time but then they they do not find anything for like the next four months and i can understand that this is a pretty terrible feeling because they they gotta live off something so it's mm-hmm. it's it's psychologically speaking i guess it's not really i don't know super relaxing and this is this is something i like about my job that i have my <laughs> my fixed income <laughs> and then you have you have different perks i mean i remember when i started the running the, the Dynatrace back when he program with HackerOne, I felt like this little child. I had used HackerOne before, I had used BugRout before, and I had all those questions all the bug bunny hunters are having now. They're like, what, what's going on in the back? Like basically the questions you're asking me today. And I got to experience firsthand what that really means. And there is so much going on in the back. And that just really excited me about running the program. Um, so talk me through kind of how you got there. What's your educational background? A lot of people who watch me are like students. Uh, kind of how did you get from starting out really in security to where you are now? Yeah, sure. I was actually, I was going to a business school when I was a teenager. And after that, I was like, business is not. Changed trajectory and, and went to. Um, studying computer security right from like my first semester and I I now have a master's in computer security so I was studying that for five years at a local university and what what I like still really like about that is that I have the full background right like a lot of people starting today they only see the money and they're mm-hmm. like what what is what is the fastest way to get it and they start with throwing access as payloads against a web app or something like that. But I don't really know anything about the, the, the deeper technical backgrounds of it. And we received that uh, at university, which is what I really appreciate. So I, I, I went through that five years of studying, and then I just applied for a job as penetration tester, which was one of the courses we had at university. And I had actually, at this point, already six months of, of experience in pen testing because I uh, had an internship at, at Siemens at that point in Germany, in Munich. And yeah, it, it, was, it was enough for me to get hired as a junior penetration tester. And then I just worked my way up um, until I guess to the point where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, so where, when you mentioned you kind of got there, do you think it was kind of a natural progression almost from going kind of like starting out as a penetration tester to then going to just going that whole career trajectory um or do you think you you kind of especially as you end up a bug bounty uh, program manager do you think that's the way to get into that i guess is my question do you go through that kind of career yeah. progression yeah I, I i don't necessarily think that this is the the one way it could work out for people uh, i guess you could 
even run a bug bunny program without having any technical knowledge at all. Because as I've said before, I mean, there's the triaging team, which is doing a tremendous job and you, you could just take their outcome and put it in Jira and talk to your developers. But it, it just really helps if you have the technical knowledge by yourself as well, because you, you can talk to the relevant people on a completely different level. But no, it's not the only way to go. I mean, you can do a lot of different things. You, you can be a developer at a certain company who is interested in security and comes up with the idea of running a backbone program. I guess there is a lot of different ways how, how you can set up a program. Um, so I got to ask, what do you really love about your job? What's the best thing about your job? The, the entire job or the, the bug bunny part of it? <laughs> um, your entire job. Well, yeah. Well, I actually, have... give me both answers because I'm curious. Both answers. I, I guess they go into the same direction anyway. So I, I'm just really, I just really love to communicate with people. And being a penetration tester, as well as being the person talking to the bug bunny handlers, you have to communicate a lot. And this is this is what brings the most joy to me, I guess. I mean, if if you have a penetration test, which is what I'm having every single week, you have a kickoff, you get to talk to the team, you get to know so many different teams. Like I, I, I guess as the security person in a company, you almost know everyone at a certain point in time, which is pretty awesome. And, and people know you and you can just talk to them freely and, and, and share um, ideas. And, and yeah, that's, that's what I like, I guess, best about it. And then you, you keep, helping them in in our case they they don't see us at the bad guys bringing the vulnerabilities and, and and blaming them they they're seeing us as help they really appreciate and and this is what i love about it this is the the communication level that we have we we test their feature we are in in, in constant exchange throughout the week we we ask them to help us during our penetration test because they know their feature way better than we do, right? And then at a certain point in time, after a week, after two weeks, we hand in the, the findings. We, we give them their cherry tickets, what they used to work with. And we have this wrap up. We, we walk them through, they're super happy. We, we are open for questions. And then even after that, we continue to help um, our developers re remediating all the findings. It's, it's a constant exchange. Like throughout the day, I guess I'm not the person who just sits in the back of his and in, 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 in like uh, the front of his computer and, and hacks on something for like nine hours. I'm more like the guy who constantly uh, tries to communicate with the teams and, and incorporate them into the actual hacking process. And this is what, what makes me a lot of fun. So I got to say, what do you hate about your job? What's the worst part of your job? Hate's probably quite a strong word. Well, I, I guess I, I, I said this before. A lot of times you have to deal with, well, legal or something like that. And, and, and it's pretty, it, it's, it's, it's common sense that this is super important. It's just not the most interesting part of the job, right? Mm. It's, it's just two, two different mindsets that are communicating with one another. And it's something uh, I, I guess we, we all have to learn and we have to get better and, and just to some sort of get on the same page. But it's, it's just a lot of times it's really cumbersome to be, it feels like being blocked by a lot of other teams, but in mm -hmm. the end it's not. I mean, they're just doing their job, what they have to do, right? It, it, it totally makes sense that this exchange takes place. Um, but yeah, as, as, as a technical guy, you would obviously just want to keep on hacking <laughs> yeah. and, and keep on get, keep on getting into submissions and, and all that stuff. But it's not just that there's, there's more to it. Um, so for people who might be interested in having your job for everything you've spoken about, what's the top three pieces of advice you'd want to give somebody who's maybe a student, maybe somebody who's interested in bug bounties but who doesn't really see themselves as a bug bounty hunter, but is super interested in the idea of managing reports or communicating, as you said. Three pieces of advice. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would still go with, if, if you can, I know this is not possible for everybody in the world because we live in different countries, but if, if you have 
time and money, I would still go for some sort of university education because I, I guess it gives you so much more than the experience of searching for XSSs in a certain program. It, it gives you a lot more background. And it's that depth with, and that breadth yeah, ab- of knowledge. No, absolutely. And that helps you a ton during like an interview if, if, if you want to get a certain job. Also, I, I, I think that internships in penetration testing are not too hard to get. I mean, just take those six months or a year, if you're like 20 to 25, and, and take that not too well-paid job, take that internship, and and use the time to learn a lot hands-on, right? like really make the best out of this time. And this is this is a, a tremendous entry in your CV. So if, if, if it says something like internship, a year in penetration testing, that's not something a lot of people have. And then I guess my, my, my other advice would, would be just don't be scared. I mean, there's so many security people needed right now, I guess more than ever. And the number of people needed is, is rising every single day. So just apply for a hell of jobs. And, and I'm pretty sure um, there will be a company picking you. And then you will have a, I don't know, junior penetration testing role, something like that. And, and then once you have... You don't take. Yeah. And then once you have that, I guess you, there's not really anything that can go wrong anymore. If, if you are like a good worker, you love your job, you do your stuff, you hack on, I don't know, like any products, there will only be one way. And this is going up. So thank you very much for speaking with me today, Pascal. I've learned so much about the internals of how it works. Um, and as you said before, if people want to make a case to join Dynatrace's program, um, they can message you. You're at Pascal Set. I'll put that on the screen so people can see it. It will also be linked in the description below. Um, of course, you run a YouTube channel as well, uh, Hacks I, I do. I do. You want to have a bit of a spiel and try and convince people to have a watch? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, I just started it two months, three months ago. I don't know. I guess I had the intro four months ago, but content really just came in two months ago. And yeah, I'm trying to provide free basic hacking videos to everybody out there. It's I, I started with um, Burp Suite 101. So like if you have not used Burp before, which is just the best tool in the world, so shout out to Port Swigger for, for giving us this You're godlike ready. tool. <laughs> Um, yeah, check out my channel to get the basics. There is um, videos being released every single weekend, so it's not um, completed by now, but just stick to it and, and find more videos. And the other big playlist that I'm having right now is going through Ovo's Choose Shop, while I try to give them ideas on, on how to hack Choose Shop, and then you can take those and run them against, I don't know, uh, a certain bug bunny program that you find on Hack One or something like that. Dynatrace. <laughs> Dynatrace. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, so thank you everybody for watching. I hope you found this super informative. Um, there's going to be more of these interviews with, obviously this is just how Dynatrace works and every other bug bounty program is going to run a little bit differently. So thank you, Pascal, for your time and your patience with explaining this to me and giving me kind of an inside look. Um, so thank you everybody for watching uh, and that's bye from me uh, and bye from Pascal. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks for having me.